Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Probably there's one place where we encounter the tremendous rudeness, selfishness, dare I say, depravity of humankind behind the wheel of our cars on the roads. When we feel all safe and contained within whatever vehicle we drive, no one can actually see through those completely transparent windows to see us shaking our fists and hollering and yelling. But they can. They do. And somewhat unashamedly, we show forth how rude human beings really can be to one another. But it doesn't always take place behind the wheel of a car. Someone might raise their voice harshly to you in public. You might hear a word spoken at work or maybe on the soccer field that's not even fit for the locker room. We like instead in our public spaces, decorum, and quiet, and calm. Sometimes, though, what appears rude, what's totally inappropriate socially, may simply be the outburst of strong conviction. Someone sees a miscarriage of justice, something wrong going on, and they just cannot remain calm. Quiet, polite, decorous. You see, conviction, a zeal for a cause, demands a dramatic, apple cart upsetting response. Now, in our text this morning, Jesus upsets apple carts and more. He creates a scene and he offends grossly. How rude! Except it's not. It's zeal for God's house. And finding his father's house being misused and abused, Jesus' zeal simply can't be kept under wraps. It goes and it bursts forth in action. You see, in Jesus' cleansing of the temple, we see firsthand Christ's zeal revealed. And this zeal is revealed in his Passover, in his person, and in his power to save us. And as a result, we, the church of God, his temple in the world, are called to be a people zealous for good works. Our text occurs then as Jesus comes into Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. Now for centuries, the Passover has been the chief revelation of God's zealous love for sinners. The Passover, you remember, had climaxed with the plagues by which God had brought his people out of slavery in Egypt. And every plague demonstrated God's zeal for the greatest commandment, love the Lord your God. In fact, each plague was a bit of an ironic twist on the false gods of Egypt. The Egyptians worshipped the Nile, frogs, the sun, even firstborn sons. And in the various plagues, God turned each and every one of these against them. Each plague was God's zealous deliverance in action. And every plague was God's zealous righteousness, opposing false gods and unbelief. And so now in our text, the zeal of Christ for the true God is revealed as well. Jesus is consumed by the sin against the temple. All those centuries, roasted lambs had conveyed the Passover miracle. And God was zealous for a people of Passover as he passed over the sins for the sake of the bloody lamb who was to come. 
Every animal whose blood was shed was a sign pointing toward that ultimate sacrifice. The sacrifice of God in the flesh. And now God in the flesh has come into His temple. God would not spare His own firstborn son in His conquest over idolatry and false worship. Instead, He gives Him willingly. Willingly so that we pass over from death to life by His zealous life, death, and resurrection. So the question then for us is, are we today living as people of the Passover? Since we are people over whom death has passed, how can we not be zealous to spread that word to others? You see, Passover is it's a powerful word of gospel from our Lord Jesus Christ. It speaks to those not covered in His blood, the law. And yet it speaks the gospel to those who are covered with the blood of Christ, the very Lamb of God. See, Jesus' zeal revealed in His Passover covers us. But does it also move us? Secondly, Christ's zeal is revealed in His person. His person that is so different from ours. Our zeal, you see, is so often like that of, well, of the merchandising Jews as we use God's church for our own ends. We seek glory, the adoration of others. We seek to be seen as a, as a good person. On the other side of the pews, pastors, elders, sometimes abuse their position to manipulate the people. Worshippers come and seek a a person-centered service of good feelings and emotional highs rather than a God-centered service where He serves you. We worship the dollar bill rather than tithes. Or if we give our tithes, we do so with tainted motives. Our thoughts even wander in worship. We treat the sacrament casually as if it's just another chore for us to get through. Only God's perfect person can come and meet our pitiful person. The zeal of the Lord of hosts meets us in the person of Christ Jesus. No bowing to decorum if it means compromising God's house. There was no polite wait. Let's see about this when it would rob God's people of the comfort and the assurance of forgiveness that they should receive when they come into His temple. There's no playing it safe, no blending in, no keeping quiet, even though this sort of outburst would very well get Him killed. No greater love, no greater intensity, no greater mercy, no greater humility could be shown us sinners than what we see in the person of Christ. With all zeal, He was obedient and He reversed the curse of Eden. With all zeal, He overpowered the devil and He bound that Satan forever. With all zeal, He covers us today with the drenching waters of baptism. And the zeal of His body and His blood covers, cleanses, and cures us of our sin. The person of Jesus Christ is authentic. He's genuine. Unlike the money changers and sinners like us, He offers more than a fair exchange. He exchanges our guilt for His acquittal. He exchanges our crosses of damnation for His cross of salvation. He exchanges our weaknesses for the strength of His resurrection. He exchanges the weak things of our world for the strong world of His heaven. And He exchanges on the last day our vile bodies 
for his victorious, glorious, resurrected body. But finally, we also see Christ's zeal revealed in his power. The money changers had power. The pious Jews coming to receive and even exchange were abused by the powers of those in high places. But the power of God in his zeal to save people, that too was abused by this world's system. But that was no weak Christ, no coward that was wielding that whip. And the grossly offended powers that be in the temple weren't even seeing the half of it. Here is God in the flesh. Now when we feel abused by taxes, by poor health, by our unfair share of struggles, When we feel no zeal or passion for life, take heart and know the Holy Spirit is near. He tenderly invites us to believe that He is our true Father and that we are His true children, so that with all boldness and confidence we may ask Him as dear children, ask their dear Father. St. Paul, in fact, reminds us rather boldly I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation. St. Paul, transformed from a zealot of self-righteousness to a servant of the zealous Jesus. And he counsels us in today's epistle. He exchanged his own foolishness for the wisdom of Christ. See, the power of Christ is unmatched. And Christ's zeal is tuned by his love. It is not reckless. It is not undirected. His energies all move toward the intent of his church. And even the gates of hell cannot prevail against this lowly yet mighty body of believers. His zeal, his power, will one day raise our lowly bodies to be like His glorious body. And Christ's zeal, though seemingly destroyed by the cross, was instead raised to power on Easter morning. And because He lives, we live forever. Jesus' passion, His person, His power, they all proclaim His zeal Keep us forever. As one of my favorite hymns goes, Salvation unto us is come by God's free grace and favor. Good works cannot avert our doom. They help and save us never. Faith looks to Jesus Christ alone, who did for all the world atone. He is our one redeemer. And may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in our zealous Lord Christ Jesus.